morning, morning. Amen. This day is different from every other day because this is the day the Lord hath made. Amen. Father, I pray, Lord, for the gift of teaching this morning. We pray for the Holy Spirit. Lord, we're ignorant, we're blind, we're scratching around in the dark. We don't know anything, though we think we know all things, except you teach us and you reveal it to us. We're willing to listen. We're willing to learn. In your holy name I pray, amen. All right, turn to the book of uh, Psalm, chapter number 2, the second psalm. Psalm chapter number 2. You hear a lot of uh, aspersions cast against anyone who believes that uh, there is a conspiracy. And uh, say, well, that's crazy to think that there's a conspiracy. Well, I believe that's what you're going to read about here in the Bible. Psalm 2 and verse 1. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Capitol Hill has a lot of these people. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, there's your conspiracy, right there, right there. Let us break their bands asunder, cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh, the Lord shall have them in derision. And then shall he speak unto them in his wrath, and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. You see that? He's, in, he's giving them the opportunity to listen, to hear instruction. And if they will, serve the Lord with fear, rejoice with trembling, kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and ye perish not from the way when his wrath is kindled, but a little blessed are all they that put their trust in him. All right. Who doeth according to his will among all the nations of the earth, the Lord is going to do as he pleases, and none can stay his hand. He is almighty God. So we understand that, and uh, we as Christians do, and we are Bible believers. We believe that. And you say, well, everything's out of hand today. It may be out of hand, but it's not out of God's hand. God knows exactly what's going to happen, when it's going to happen. And the truth of the matter is, before the foundation of the world, this was all established and predetermined in the mind of God. Known unto God are all of his works. He figured that in. He figured man's rebellion in. And everything that you see today, it doesn't mean he approves of it, but it also means that no one can stay his hand and he doeth according to his own will. God is God, folks. Amen. He's not a man like us. Now, uh, here's a 70-year-old man. I'm going to take some of the things that he says in his observations of uh, the culture of 2019. The people of the earth, the rulers of the, of the world, the kings and the queens, the princes, parliaments and the, uh, the, uh, the Capitol Hill, like we've got a dog to fight. It'd be nice to have a government that worked, wouldn't it? But what we have up here on Capitol Hill and uh, so forth and so on, when men try to rule themselves, they have the hardest time in the world. They like to rule over other nations and over each other, but to try to rule themselves, it's hard to govern yourself. It's a hard thing, and when we have a governor of a state like we do here in Tennessee, just elected a new one a few months back, down there in Nashville, what's his name? That's right, Lee. It's easy to remember. You remember the Confederate general? <laughs> I doubt if he's any kin to him, but it's an easy name to remember, Lee. And you watch him as he governs the state of Tennessee to see how it works and see if he helps the state and see if he brings commerce into the state and see if he oversees the, uh, the, uh, the judicial system of the state and all of that because the governor has, a has an enormous responsibility. You have a senator and you have a representative that go off to Washington, they don't govern anything. 
they're, they're called lawmakers, and they sit up there and they debate and they, and they play political games of chess, and uh, that's exactly what you have, and this is exactly what's going on right now in Washington, D.C. They are playing political chess, and uh, so you can see that. But here's what this man said. Listen carefully, smart man. Listen carefully. Humanity has been colonized by a satanic cult, the Sabbatean Frankists, later called the Illuminati. They were mostly Jews, but they recruited opportunistic second-rate Gentiles, he puts Freemasons in parenthesis, who knew they couldn't get ahead without selling their soul. And many of Hollywood's elite have confessed to selling their soul. For, uh, for advancement. This Gentile leadership class was chosen from the ranks of criminals, Satanists, and pedophiles in order to control them using blackmail. Now, is his observation right? Is he pretty right on? I think he is. I think he is. <clears throat> the Illuminati wished to enslave humanity mentally, if not physically, and force it to serve the Illuminati leaders. Are they enslaving humanity? They achieve this, now listen carefully, they achieve this incredible power by devising a banking system where they produce the means of exchange, currency, credit, in the form of interest-bearing debt to themselves. Now, I don't profess to be an economics professor at all, but I do know in 1913 on Jekyll Island, everything changed. And I do know that when the Federal Reserve System was established to control the government, to control, to control the money supply of this country, it changed. And I also know they added an income tax but, uh, as a product of that, 1913, Jekyll Island. I've learned a little bit about fractional banking. How many of you know what that is? Fractional banking is when a bank may have on hand 500 million, a billion, two billion dollars, but it can loan out seven, eight, 10, 12 billion dollars. It only has to have on hand X number of dollars. That's called fractional banking. In other words, if they had a run on the bank, they could not give the depositors their money back. Now here's the top of that. They can print money. The Federal Reserve controls the printing of money. And then they turn around and take money that has been printed and created out of thin air and they loan it to people, and they charge interest on it. This is what's going on right here. This is exactly what's happening. How many of you have ever heard of a Knights Templar? All right, then you've got Knights Templar. The, uh, there was pilgrimages to the Holy Land. People would leave their country, and they would travel to the Holy Land. They would need to be able to buy and sell money, exchange. And so they found that it's quite a problem, so the Templars were the money changers. They were the ones stationed along the way who would change, exchange money so that you could use it to use whatever uh, currency that you had for wherever you were. Now, here's what happens. These people became very wealthy. The Knights Templar became very wealthy because anybody that changes money, exchanges money, is going to make a pile of money. Remember this. If it doesn't make sense, somebody's making money. <laughs> That's truth. Some people, the only thing they do all day long is sit around and figure out how they can make money off of you and not raise a finger. But anyway, they loaned money to kings. The reason they did is because it costs money to wage war. It's expensive, very expensive. They loaned money to the kings. The king of France owed a pile of money to the Knights Templar. So what did he do? Being a king, he brought them up on charges of sodomy, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, witchcraft, of occultism, of uh, sedition, and all kinds of things. He brought them up on charges. And then when he did this, it gave him the legal basis to literally put them to death. Now, and of course, his personal motive in it was so if he could destroy these people, he wouldn't have to pay them back. You know how the law works, don't you? Understand that. And so he, 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 he did. And the... Uh, the, the leader of the Knights Templar, he's, his name was uh, De Mole. There we go. And he was put to death at the stake, burned at the stake, on Friday the 13th, 
of such and such a year. Anybody remember the year? I don't remember the year. Now, it has come down in our culture that the 13th day of the month, if it falls on a Friday, what kind of a day is that? That's a bad omen, right? That's a bad day, Friday the 13th. Do you know that they build a lot of, a lot of hotels, high-rise buildings, and they go from the 12th floor to the 14th floor? That's why they have that little evergreen when they, when they build. Have you ever seen the evergreen on top of a building? When they, as they construct it or as they have just finished it, that's, that has all to do with superstition. The number 13 is a number of rebellion. How many colonies rebelled against King George? 13. 13 colonies. So this is what happened. They controlled the money, and therefore by controlling the money, they had enormous power. And so he charged them with this, and, and a lot of them died, but a lot of them escaped. And they say that a lot of them came to the United States a long time before, uh, before what we know today, and, and they were not, uh, it was not recorded as a historical fact. Now, to get back to what we're talking about here, the money is being controlled. If the Federal Reserve wants to shut off the money supply, it can shut it off. That's what happened in 1929. They shut off the money supply. You say, well, have the, they didn't, nobody had any money. Who financed Hitler? Some of the biggest corporations in this country financed Hitler. Did you all know that? I know that's not common knowledge, and I know, there, I know a lot of people don't like to know that. Ford Motor Company financed Hitler, along with other major. Now, this, of course, is when Hitler was put on the, what was he, the Man of the Year on Time magazine, or which one was it that published him, showed Hitler, and the Nazi Party. But this was back in the early 30s. This was when the Nazi Party was building Germany before it became the, uh, the, the executioner of all the Jews. And so Hitler was a hero. He was, he was you know, they, he was somebody to emulate. So they put his face on Time Magazine. He was the man of the year, Adolf Hitler. That's fact. Now, I don't know if it's Time or one of them, Look Life, but he's on the face of one of those magazines. He had enormous amount of money coming into Germany to build up Germany. And where is this money coming from? While here in this country, 1929, the stock market crashes, and the people in this country literally go into, into, into poverty. How many have ever seen an Okie as they travel west? They're, they're uh, beating down jalopies, and they're traveling west, and it's during the time when they had all these dust bowls and everything, and they had their possessions hanging off of an old worn-out vehicle. They would call them Okies, and they were traveling. Why? Well, because they were in the midst of a depression. And this depression was created by the people who could shut down the money supply. And this may happen again. Who knows? Because you can control people when you control that. And, of course, it brought FDR to power. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was sworn into office the same year that Adolf Hitler became the chancellor of Germany. Same year. It's interesting to watch the parallel between the two men as to how they developed the country. Now, of course, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and introduced the New Deal, and he's trying to get this country out of out of uh, out of this depression. And uh, he knew that if war ever started, uh, everything speeds up during wartime, and uh, we wound up getting into World War II. But let's get back on our subject here. They are controlling the money supply. There's no question about that. They achieve this incredible power by devising a banking system where they produce the medium of exchange in the form of interest-bearing debt to themselves. They use this golden goose to take control of everything of value, including corporations, resources, and all social institutions, government, media, religion, justice, and education. That's mind-boggling. Now listen carefully. Their, their stupefying political correctness prevents free political and cultural expression that's a big deal. Their political correctness prevents free political and cultural expression. And this, we've lost our country if we can't get freedom of speech back. Amen. Let me give you a scenario this morning. This is something you can think about. You know that homosexuals march through the streets in certain cities. You understand that, don't you? And you don't, you'll never see the mainstream media put the photographs of the way they dress themselves and what they look like when they go through this. You won't see that. You're not going to see that. It doesn't fit the, the agenda. But the people that have been there photograph it. And the, uh, 
alternative media, or whatever you want to call it, will show you photographs of these people and what they do. There's one in particular where this homosexual is standing there naked in front of a, about a five or a six year old boy, right in front of him. And that little boy is looking at him and you would not believe the horror on the face of that child. Now this is what we're talking about. Don't kid yourself, forget CBS, NBC, and ABC, that's garbage. All of this stuff that I give you is documented. Now think about it. If they showed the American people what goes on in homosexuality, in sodomy, you want to know why the Bible condemns it? The Bible's the Word of God. If they showed the American people what really goes on, you'd see a revolution overnight. But they're not going to do it. And some of you in here don't know what they do, and that's just as well. The Bible said it's a shame to speak of those things in public. So that's good enough. It's good enough. It'd make you sick. So you just, just remember that it's not something they want everybody to see or know what they're doing. But political correctness assaults free speech. Free speech is my ability to stand up here this morning and say what I just said. See? Now here they come against me and they say, well, this preacher down here on Woodrow, he's preaching hate speech. He's a homophobe. What's the word homophobe mean? Phobia is a so-called scientific term, which means you have an irrational fear. Irrational fear. A fear not based in fact, but a fear that is illusionary. It has to do with your experiences or what have you. And it's not, it, it should, it's, it's a kind of a fabricated fear. That's a phobia. All right. So when they use the term homophobia, they're saying that you have an irrational fear of homo homosexuals and you shouldn't fear them because they're just like you. They're citizens of the country. Now, if you allow hate speech, so-called hate, they, they're the ones who define it, by the way. They create the term, they define it, and they apply it. If you let hate speech begin to govern free speech in this country, the day will come. You sit back and you say, well, I, don't, I can't do anything about it. You know, I'm, it's, I can't, I'm just one voice. The day will come. When they'll take your child, your child, and they will force them to go in a, and, and, and view a parade. You'll, you'll, take, you'll, be at the, you'll take your child. If you don't take it, they'll take it away from you. Your child will be forced to go observe, watch a parade of some of the worst stuff you ever saw in your life. It's unbelievable at what these kids will have to see. And if you don't let them do it, you say, you're, you're a crazy preacher. No, I'm not. The two things, two things that, that uh, propel this world, two things, they rise above everything else. Greed and fear. How many of you agree with that? Greed and fear. Now think about it. If your child says, Mama, if your daughter says, Mama, I'm a boy. I, they taught me something in school and I just feel like I'm a boy. You say back to your daughter, and honey, look, we need to, you know, let's, let's deal with this, and let's work through this, and, and I love you, and, and we want you to grow into a, a beautiful young woman, and we want you to be a wife and a mother, and, 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 and she said, no, no, mama, I'm a boy, because they've convinced me in school that I'm a boy, and uh, some of that convincing has to do with the drugs they shoot into your children, and it has to do with the education they're giving them, but in any event, you say, no, I can't buy this. I can't accept this. Then the knock at the door from the political correct crowd, we want your child. And they'll take your child away from you. Now, we're not there right now, but we're headed there. You're headed toward totalitarianism. You're, it would make Hitler look like a Sunday school teacher as to what's coming right now. If two homosexuals come to your business, if you, let's say you have a printing business and you print, you print uh, flyers and you print uh, cards and stuff for weddings and so forth, they come and say, we want you to print some cards for our wedding. You say, I'm sorry, I can't do that. It's just against my religious faith, my beliefs. And they say, uh, well, this is hate. We'll go and we'll sue you. Instead of saying, well, okay, we respect you, what you, what you if it's what you believe, okay, and go down to the next guy. It's not like you're the only guy in town that has food and you're making people meet some kind of a code when they come to get food from you. 
If you're the only person in town with food, you don't care what, who they are. As a human being, humanity, you're going to feed them, right? But when it comes to a matter of them saying, well, you're going to force you. We want you to photograph our wedding. And so we're going to force you to do it. And you say, no. Well, then here's what happens. Your business in jeopardy. Your freedom is in jeopardy. Your livelihood is in jeopardy. Everything you have is in jeopardy. You say, well, that's somewhere down the road, 10 or 20 years down the road. Preacher, no, it's right now. It's right now. And you can sit in the churches. You can sit inside these buildings, inside these walls. And you can do like they did in World War II in Nazi Germany. I read a thing one time that said, sing a little louder. It was a track, something. I forget where it was. And what it was, the church is sitting here, and right behind it is a railroad. Okay? There's a railroad. You can hear the trains coming. And the people were having worship services, and they could hear the train coming. And they knew that that train was carrying Jews to be gassed. All right? So what did they do? They sang a little louder. Why'd they sing louder? So they wouldn't have to hear the train. You see what I mean? So they wouldn't have to hear it. In other words, they stuck their head down in the sand. America is going to, we're at a crossroads, folks. It's, it's, it's not a matter of what's going to happen. It's now that you have to make a decision. You say, well, now, preacher, you know, it's no big deal. It will be a big deal if they come to you when you're on your job site. And they say, now, we expect X number of dollars out of you to support the uh, this and that, whatever they want to call it. And if you don't give us that money, go hunt another job. And you say, well, wait a minute. That's not fair. I mean, every man should have the freedom of his conscience, shouldn't he? Oh, yeah, that's what Thomas Jefferson said and the rest of them. I agree. But not under political correctness. Not under these rabid left-wing people who will take everything you've got away from you if you don't march to their tune and live the way they force you to live. America, when it had freedom of speech, was a wonderful country in that sense. You had a constitution. When they ratified the constitution, they had a dogfight over it. Some of the states didn't like the way it was worded and all this, but they finally ratified it. And then they came back, I think it was two or three years later, and they began to amend it. They added amendments to it. Because they got to thinking, now wait a minute, this Constitution doesn't cover everything, and some of these things are very, very important. And you know what the First Amendment they, they, they made to that Constitution? Freedom of speech and freedom of the press. That's right. And the press will scream to high heaven if you try to, if you try to, if you try to shut them out of something. Or, what, you know, they're going to they're gonna cover themselves. Freedom of speech was the first amendment to the Constitution. You know what they called it? They called it the Bill of Rights. God ordained these. Government doesn't give you the freedom to speak. God gives you the freedom to speak. Time and time and time again in the creation of this country, in these original documents, they make reference to God. We know by these things that all men are created equal or are endowed by their creator with inalienable, unalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and what? They recognize the sovereignty of a human being. We're all human, every one of us, made in the image of God. We as Christians know that man is a fallen creature, and we know that that man, the only way he's going to be right with God is through the Lord Jesus. We know that. But we also appreciate the fact that we can get on a stump and we can preach the word of God. We appreciate that. That's a good thing because where they came from in Europe, they could not do that. That's why the pilgrims, one of the reasons they left out of Holland, uh, because that uh, when they were in Holland, they, they, left, they left England, went to Holland, stayed in Holland, I think it was 10 or 12 years or something. And what they saw happening in Holland was the, Holland, the, the Dutch were pretty liberal people. And they saw them affecting their children. They saw how that this liberalism was, was, was sneaking in, was taking hold of their children. And so what they do? They packed up and left. And they came to the, to the new world, to the new country, and brought their kids with them. Because here's what he said. Here's what that pilgrim said. He said, my kids are worth more to me than my house and my job 
my country or whatever else. My kids are a gift from God, the heritage of the Lord, and I love my children, and I'm going to do whatever I have to to see to it that they have the same freedoms that I have in this case here or over there, that they got something better than what I've had. And so the country, America, was established, it was built on an ideological principle, an idea. That's what makes an American. Red, yellow, black, and white, that doesn't make an American. Asian, Afri African, European, that doesn't make an American. Here's what makes an American, the way you think. The way you think. If you're free here, you're free. It's the way you think. That's what makes an American. You've got freedom to think. Debate's the best thing that ever was. Defend your position. You believe it? I believe this. You believe that. Defend it. I'll defend mine. You've got a right to believe what you believe. I've got a right to believe what I believe. If I go to a college uni university and I go in there to lecture the people and 50 or 75 nutballs show up and they're not going to let me speak, what happened to freedom of speech? What happened to it? And this is happening all over the country right now in colleges, all over the country. A conservative goes in there to speak and they'll scream him down. Berkeley, 1964, 65, out there in California, you can see, you can see uh, placards, you can see signs where it said, freedom of speech, the greatest freedom. That's what the kids were preaching back in the 60s in Berkeley. Berkeley's not known to be some great uh, conservative bastion. Look how it's changed. Now it's all built on political correctness. Well, all we can do is warn you. All we can do is tell you that this political correctness, and this man observes it, and he observes it well. He said, art has been trivialized, debased, universities gutted, and the masses distracted by endless, mind-numbing entertainment. And I'm going to make a bunch of you mad right here. I grew up listening to music that had music. It had words. It had a tune. There was a message in it. I'm talking about the secular stuff. Uh, most of it love songs, stuff like that. You get on YouTube and all of that's on YouTube. I mean, <laughs> it's unbelievable the stuff that's on YouTube. You listen to this stuff they're singing today. All it is is a racket. A racket. And it's all electronic. A lot of this, it's all, and here's why. The country has become so shallow. Churches are so shallow that everything is geared toward feelings. Feelings. How do I feel? I went to church. I went to this church Sunday. How did I feel? Well, what did the preacher say? Well, I don't know what he said, but I felt good. I had feelings. There you go. What's going on in the country? I don't know, but I feel the vibes. Don't you feel them? I feel good. <laughs> there we go. Now, here's what happens. There was a time when people thought they believed something. They stood for something. The Bible said to study to show yourself approved to God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. An informed populace, but they have dumbed them down. You'd be surprised you go through the store and buy something at the checkout counter if they don't have a if they don't have a calculator right there. I don't know what to do. They're lost. Completely lost. You ask him, you say, who is George Washington? No, here's a good one. <laughs> who were the participants in the Civil War? I've seen him ask him that. Uh, you ever heard of the war? between the North and the South, a bloody confrontation that never should have taken place. Amen. But it did. 500,000 men, women, died in that war. They don't, want, they don't know their history. Therefore, they don't know what this country is about. They don't know where we came from. They don't know the birth pains that it's gone through and what's created us today. That's exactly what they want because they want to make a global citizen out of them. 
They want them to be a global citizen. They don't, America is just a, is just a apostrophe in history. It's all about the great global community. And they believe in it strongly, boy. They think that's the only way that they'll ever have peace in the earth. The Illuminati are Kabbalist psychopaths who believe in destroying civilization so they can rebuild society according to their perversions. World wars are orchestrated. The Illuminati is the agent. How many's ever heard of the Georgia Guidestone? Down here in Georgia. The Georgia Guidestone. Well, there's a lot of uncertainty about how it came to be. I've watched some documentaries on it, and one documentary said this guy came in off the street. He didn't, uh, they've never seen him before, and he gave them a pile of money and said, I want you to erect this stone, and I want you to put this on it, and they never saw him again, but they took the money, and they put up the, they put up the Georgia Guidestones. On the Georgia Guidestone, it says that the population needs to be down to 500 million people. 500 million. Need to get it down because the, the world is full of useless eaters. Do you know who used that term, useless eater? Sure did. The communists did. Useless eaters. It needs to be whittled down to 500 million people. You think these people care anything about human life? No, not at all. Not at all. So they're going to, they're going to, they're going to pare it down. How are we going to do this? Most of these survivors will be conscripted to serve the Illuminati. Notions of freedom, democracy, love, marriage, family will be erased from memory. All property will belong to the state. That is, the Illuminati, the Illuminati bankers and their allies. Now listen to this one carefully. People will be conceived in laboratories and raised in state nurseries and schools never having families, never knowing love. How many of you know what CRISPR-Cas9 is? I've mentioned it in here before. I was talking to my doctor a few weeks back. We get in there, we start talking about everything under the sun. <coughs> I mentioned CRISPR-Cas9 to him. He'd never heard of it. This is no aspersion on him, he's a good doctor. You can't keep up with everything. No way in the world. But he'd never heard of it. What is it, preacher? It is the ability to slice a gene, program it, and program it, design whatever you want to do with that, with that DNA that, that literally codes that gene. There's a process of slicing. There's a process of entering into that gene and doing what you want to. And it's, I can't get into all the technical aspects of it. Bottom line is it creates designer babies. Okay, CRISPR-Cas9 has the ability to create designer babies. Now, it's not cheap. When you get into this stuff, it's not cheap. So what are you saying? I'm saying that the elite, the people who have the money, will be able to reproduce themselves, design their people, design what's coming, while the poor old Joe like us, you know, that we don't have anything. We just have to die out. When they get to the point where they control birth, and they're at that point, they're getting, and when they get to that point, then they will, they, will, they will realize their desire to eliminate useless eaters and program a super elite humanity. And that's what they're working on. They ser seriously are, folks. They're working on that. They want to create a superhuman, superhuman, where all of these traits have been, have been programmed into them before they're ever born. If they took the trait of this grandfather over here, and this grandmother, this great-grandfather, this mother, this dad, and all of that, and they reach back into their tree, and they pull all of this stuff together, and they can read it in the DNA, and they say, well, great-grandfather had that, and there it is. And they pull this out, and they pull that, and they put it together, and they've got their superhuman. Isn't that amazing? Does it sound like science fiction to you? Yeah, 50 years ago, this was science fiction. It's not anymore. CRISPR-Cas9. Look it up when you get home. C-R-I-S-P-R-E, I think, or E-R-C-A-S-9. CRISPR-Cas9. And you'll be surprised at what you find when you look that up. 
truly sad to see all the social institutions subverted the point where government, schools, businesses encourage promiscuity, pedophilia, and gender dysphoria. Societies being inducted into their satanic cult as servants. The satanic cult controls and exploits its members by making them sick morally and physically. Now it's happening. And it's happening because it's happening on a level that no, you don't see when you go to the store. You don't hear about it on the job. You're sure not going to see it on TV. But it's happening at a level. At a level. That's up there where they're doing this. They're going to make this stuff, uh, they're, going to make it, uh, they're going to make it mainstream. And you can see it happening now. So why is this happening? Look over here in the book of Luke, chapter number 16, verse 16. Luke 16, 16. That statin drug just about destroyed my nervous system. Luke 16, 16. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. All right, hold your place there and go to Matthew eleven twelve. Matthew eleven twelve. Now these this is the Lord talking here. Matthew eleven twelve. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven, of course that you have to define what we're talking about, but the kingdom of heaven is this kingdom here on this earth, suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. The same Greek word, biatso, beta, iota, alpha, zeta, omega, with the accent on the alpha, biatso. That means by violent force to take to seize, to force out of your way, to drive your will over someone else. That's what he said. The Lord said that. He said that kingdom, his kingdom on this earth that he's not ruling right now, is suffering that kind of seizure. Ever since man's been on this earth, he's killing, been killing each other. Man's good at killing. And uh, Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer and Einstein worked on the atomic bomb. Robert Oppenheimer, you didn't hear much about him, but he was a brilliant man. When he saw what that, uh, when he saw what that, uh, that uh, atomic bomb did to Hiroshima and Nagasaki, there's a video of him quoting the Bhagavad Gita, which is an Eastern holy text. And I don't remember exactly what the quotation was, but it had to do with, we have come as masters to destroy ourselves. In plain words, he had second thoughts about what they had created. And for the rest of Oppenheimer's life, he became a sore in the hands of the government when it related to the atomic program. In other words, once he saw what an atomic bomb could do to a human being, he started turning against the thing that they had created. And if we know to this morning what an atomic bomb can do to a human being, I'm going to ask you a question. Is there a man on this earth that you would trust the future of this world to? Is there a government that you would trust the future of this world to? They're already in you know, the big deal with Iran is, you know, we don't, want them, we don't want them to get a nuclear weapon. That's what the big deal is. Saudi Arabia, if Iran gets one, Saudi Arabia has to have one. Jordan has to have one. The regional powers have to have one. See what I mean? You get into arms race. And that's where we're headed now. Would you trust a jihadist if he got his hands a hold of a, let's say, a tactical nuclear weapon, you know, limited in scope? If he got his hands on a tactical nuclear weapon not to use it? Well, of course he'd use it. They flew planes into the World Trade Towers and killed over 3,000 people. Didn't give a second thought to it. Didn't know a soul. I doubt if they knew the name of one person that died. Not one of them. But they died at their hands. We're talking about a radical religion that was born in 632 A.D., somewhere in there. 
In other words, I will not trust my future, my life, my hope, my family, my treasure to a government. That doesn't mean I'm anti-government. The Lord Jesus said, render to Caesar that which is Caesar's. That's a powerful statement. <laughs> In plain the words, Caesar doesn't own everything. And there are things that Caesar may, have to, may try to take possession of that don't belong to him. This is what the Constitution is about in this country. It all started good. The idea was good. It really was. The, when you go back and look at it, you say, these are smart men. They were smart men. Now I want you to see this last one, Luke 22, verse 36. And the reason I go back over these, you've seen them before, but you would be surprised at how many people have been in church all their lives and they, their pastor has never one time ever preached this scripture. Luke 22, verse 36. And he said unto them, But now, he that hath a purse, let him take it, and likewise his script, and he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. You get that? And buy one. Jan Sobieski was the king of Poland in 1683. The Muslims had pushed their way all the way to the gates of Vienna, Vienna, Austria, the gate to Europe. Jan, uh, John Sobieski, the king of, of uh, Poland, took his army and pulled cannon to the top of a mountain, a big hill, where he could fire down upon the Muslims. And this Catholic king and these Catholic fighters faced off against these Muslim hordes from the east, and they stopped them, and there was a complete victory, and the gates to Europe remained closed. You say, well, I don't believe something like that. Let me tell you, God can use anybody he wants to. You've got to remember that. You've got to remember that. That's important. But here's the point. If they'd made it through Vienna, if they'd made it into Europe, what would have happened? When Charles Martel, at the Battle of Tours, they called him the hammerer, went into battle with a big hammer, Bang! My went, bam, just like that. Imagine wars fought like that. Big sword. Come down, chop a man's head right off. Hack him in pieces. That's the way they fought. At the Battle of Tours, he stopped the Muslims from coming up from the south. He stopped them. What if he hadn't? In other words, God had a reason for Europe surviving. There's a reason for it. I'm sure at the time they probably didn't, couldn't see that far in the future. He had a reason for it. The reason was he wanted those pilgrims to go across that ocean. And he wanted them to land over here in this new world. And he wanted them to start preaching the gospel. That's what he wanted. And he got what he wanted. If he had to use a Catholic or a Baptist or a Methodist or a Presbyterian, he got what he wanted. Because he worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. I don't have much time left in this world. But I want to tell you one thing, until I draw my last breath, I'm going to get on the firing line, and I'm going to do what God's called me to do, and I'm not going to bow, and I'm not going to uh, backpedal to any political correct crowd. I'm not going to do it, and they're wasting their time if they think they're going to force me to do it. Ain't going to happen. Ain't going to happen. Not going to happen. Uh, I'll fight them tooth and toenail, and I'll gum them to death if I don't have any teeth. <laughs> until I'm gone from here. Amen. Because I feel a whole lot better about doing it that way than just crawling up somewhere in some corner somewhere and, and just meekly handing it to them. No, buddy, we're going to fight. If that's what it takes, if that's, if, that's what, if that's what God puts us into, then fight the good fight of faith. Amen. Go over there to Hebrews 11 before you go to bed tonight and read over there in Hebrews 11 where it said they put the enemy to flight. And those are the people of faith. Amen. So keep that in mind. All right, I'm done. We'll, we'll, uh, we're going to hear some good preaching here in a few minutes. 
And I see he's come in with his family. He's got his beautiful wife and his children. He's got a beautiful family. I don't know how you deserve that, but he has. And uh, he's going to be preaching to us in a few minutes, Brother uh, McNeese. And I look forward to hearing that. Amen. All right, let's pray, and we'll, uh, we'll let you go. Our Father, we thank you for your word, time we have to spend together. And our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the truth of the word of God. May we stand true to it as long as there's breath in this body. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.